and we're live. Good evening. Uh, this is calling to order the Tuesday, December 1st, 2020 uh, meeting of the Rollingwood Utility Commission. Uh, we will start with a roll call and I'll make it easy by calling attendance since the order will be strange on, um, on Zoom. So Clark Wilson. Uh, here. Jonathan Miller, I am here. Chris Meekin. He's muted. Did you? <laughs> Present. Thank you. And Phil Dixon. Present. Excellent. And we know that Ronald, Sam, um, and William were unable to attend. So that is our quorum for tonight. Moving on to public comments. Were there any public comments this evening? I don't see anyone else in our audience tonight. All right, we'll give it just a minute. All right, seeing how there are no public comments, we will move on. Uh, to the consent agenda, discussion uh, and possible action on the minutes from October 6, 2020 Utility Commission meeting. So this would be for the adoption uh, and approval and adoption of the minutes for that meeting. I move to, <clears throat> I move to adopt them. Second. Second the motion. We have a second on the motion to adopt the minutes. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <coughs> Motion passed. Moving on to the regular agenda. The first item is discussion and possible action on a quote from Nelisa Heaton to perform a study of the city's LUE assignment and policy. Uh, so this was one of the um, packages that was sent uh, by Ashley this afternoon, also included in the meeting agenda outlining this particular um, quote. So, Ashley, is there any comments that we want to make, Ashley or Amber, in, in advance of just turning it over? Um, I don't think so, no. Um, I think the proposals um, definitely had all the information we needed in them, and then Nelise is here to, to briefly present them and, and answer any questions you guys might have. John, may I make one comment? And um... Ms. Hedden, I don't want you to take anything by this because I think you did a fabulous job for us. Is this something we have to put out for bids, Ashley? Sorry, I'm muting. Um, no, it's not. Um, okay. General. I don't want to, but <laughs> I, I think I'm very happy with our expert. Great. Great. Absolutely. I want to make sure it's all done in a way where it's. And given how this relates to the wastewater um, proposal that we just review that we rate study that we just did, is that the driving force behind getting this now? It's, hey, we have wastewater. We know that wastewater is tied to LUE. Let's go back and make sure we uh, tighten up and under, clearly understand the definitions around the LUE process. Is that basically the point? Correct. Yes. Okay. So... So I will turn the floor over uh, to you, Nalisa, however you'd like to go through this. I found it very straightforward, um, but I'm sure there's a few key elements that you'd want to point out as we uh, take a look at this particular uh, service offering. Okay, well, good evening. It's a pleasure to see you all again. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, the proposal you have concerning the LUE determinants uh, looks at, and as you know, as we went through wastewater, uh, your rate state for your wastewater utility, we looked at uh, setting a base fee for commercial connections using a living unit equivalent. And uh, absent any other information, we had to rely on your currently set LUEs for those connections. Uh, what we identified through that process, however, is that we really don't know and have a lot of history pertaining to when they were determined, how much, what they're based off of, and probably more of a concern or, or equally of a concern, at least uh, from your staff's perspective, is also for a new connection coming on, how do they determine what do you do to assign an LUE? 
And likewise, uh, for customers, if any of your existing customers were to come in and say, well, how is this determined? Unfortunately, we don't have an answer for them today. Um, and so I think one of the biggest things is to get to a clear definition of an LUE. Um, an LUE uh, by the industry standard is called a living unit equivalent. And in the water wastewater utility industry, we use it for lots of purposes. From a rate making or a, a purpose, we assign LUEs uh, to for oftentimes in the base fee realm. It's a multiplier we apply to a base fee uh, to determine what a residential customer is versus what a commercial customer is, to put it into all like normalized terms. Uh, from an engineering perspective, we plan our facility sizes based off of LUEs. That's all well and good. And the purpose there, again, is to normalize what we're talking about. Uh, the problem, though, is we don't have uh, standards in the industry for how an LUE is determined. Part of that is because it's uh, very different. It depends on, one, why you're doing it, and two, the specific uh, circumstances of any individual utility. Some of the most common ways to determine an LUE include meter size. So we assign an equivalency ratio. So maybe a two inch meter is the equivalent of five LUEs, for example. Uh, the second way we can do it is we can go in and look at historical use of customers, gather that data and say, okay, you use on average X many times more water or wastewater than a residential customer. So your L you are 15 LUEs versus your neighbor who's 12 based off of that historical use. Other common ways to do it are looking at the facility or the commercial facility use type, such as a restaurant or a retail facility, et cetera. Uh, we can also look at it in square footage terms um, or a combination of those two items. The other way to look at it is the number of plumbing fixtures. So there's lots of different ways and there's pros and cons to each of those ways. Um, and we have to strike a balance that gets to something that's fair and equitable. Um, also though, that can be implemented by your staff and your billing company. Uh, what we don't wanna do is come up with something that's so complicated, uh, it's hard to implement. Um, and also something that we can communicate clearly with your customers so they'll understand. That being said, what the proposal is, is looking at is that we would develop LUE assignments will take all of your commercial customers and I'll give them to you on a spreadsheet. We'll have your current LUE assignment per customer and then we'll develop LUE assignments for each customer based upon these different options. Uh, we'll then talk through with you uh, and of course city council through the options available, the pros and cons. You can look at what those base charges are uh, based off of those each option. Uh, so you can see which options affect customers more dramatically. Uh, we'll talk about the total revenue of those options and the pros and cons of each based off of those options. After we've gone through all of that, uh, once you and the city council select your preferred option, We'll then come back and give your staff an SOP that allows them to implement this for all new customers. We'll also obviously give that spreadsheet to your billing company so they know how to assign uh, the LUEs to your existing customers. Uh, so, so it's a, a little bit of a circular process, but we want to make sure that you understand all the options that are out there and we can weigh those pros and cons of each of them. So that's, in a nutshell, what that engagement entails. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Lisa, would you share some of your experience in doing this with other communities and how it played out and what was the good things and what was the bad things and, you know, what did you learn and... Sure, what a great question. Uh, probably one of the best communities to uh, give as an example would be your neighbor, the West Travis County PUA that serves Bee Cave, uh, the city of Bee Cave and Northern Hayes counties. Um, they have a very unique customer set uh, ranging from in a very difficult customer set. 
They have a whole lot of wholesale customers and a whole lot of retail customers. Um, they also have customers who are retail in residential sus subdivisions that are on little bitty teeny tiny lots that have hardly anything, um, that don't have any landscaping. And then they have homes on two and three acre lots with big, beautiful green lawns. Um, they also have the Galleria, so they have a huge mix of commercial customers. And so what we had to do with them, we looked at, in, in this really started as part of their impact fees and then has continued to progress into impact fees, engineering design, as well as from a rate making perspective, um, their impact fees are set on a use type by square footage. So they have a table that sets uh, based upon each connection's uh, specific use. So a restaurant is treated differently than a retail uh, store, for example. Um, a grocery store is treated differently than a hotel. Uh, it's based off of a matrix of that in the square footage uh, that applies and crosses over through. Um, that is how their impact fees are determined. I will tell you that um, from an engineering perspective, it has, has tied out fairly closely to what actually happens on the system. From a political perspective, uh, a lot of customers, especially commercial customers, really didn't like it because it assigned much more LUE factors over to those connections compared to using a meter size table. Um, the problem with a meter size table, for example, is you could have a two inch meter on PetSmart who has just a restroom. They use 10,000 gallons of water a month and a two inch meter uh, Maudie's out there that uses 100,000 gallons of water a month. So it, it was very difficult. Um, customers didn't like it. Uh, what the PUA eventually did was allow customers to, they would charge based on the table. Um, but if customers brought in data from a similar facility uh, for a new customer assessing impact fees, the PUA would consider that. So if it was like Nitro, for example, big pool facility, they have other facilities. So they were able to <laughs> say, hey, this is what our other facility does um, and have alternate considerations. Um, they also allow the customers to have a reassessment of their fee uh, after the fact, after they've established a full year of service. Um, on the residential side, on that example, residential customers, uh, the, the goal was to, to equalize and make things a little bit fairer for residential customers. Um, on the rate making side, uh, instead of applying that table across what they do on their rates, is they apply, we go in every time they do a rate study, which is three to five year periods of time, they go in and pull the uh, historical use by meter size. So we go in and look at each customer's uh, historical usage by the size of their meter. And we develop our own LUE factors based off of the use for the meter. So, it's easier to implement. We do it once. We apply the scale through on the meter size, and that's what the billing company has. Their tariff is easy to understand because you have a base fee for each meter size, and that's all you have to have. Um, the, but there is some inequities in there related to when I gave you the example of a two-inch meter. And unfortunately, you kind of have to get to some point, um, and that's where they got to their happy medium. Uh, but that's one example of how complex and how the different options could play out. So I think I'm hearing there's a, a real answer, there's a political answer, and the let's not drive Amber to, to run away answer. That's correct. That's correct. And we've got to find some sort of hybrid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I think my question was premature as opposed to when you come back with your results. Sure. No, it was a great question, though. Uh, I had one question around um, the deliverable. Uh, very clear when we get to the next quote on the rate study uh, as what is what is being delivered for each uh, portion of that that analysis. 
for this analysis, ultimately we wanna to get to adopting a definition around LUE within our policy. Um, what is there? Is there any other deliverable that we would receive documentation wise that we would be able to refer back to as this was the guidance, this is the base uh, that we used in order to determine the language that you now see in policy? I, I just wanted to confirm what other deliverable was included in, in this. Great question. We'll give you a memo report that outlines the alternatives. Um, for you so you can have a document that says what the alternatives were and the way each alternative was determined. Uh, so you'll have a list of options, if you will. So you can adopt that. It describes the method that was used. That's the first. The second deliverable will be the LUE assignment. Um, it'll also come in the form of a memo that can be given to your billing company that gives specific directions on how to build the customers. Uh, and then the third deliverable will be an SOP document for your staff to use in assigning LUEs going forward um, to the extent it may be different, you know, depending on how the, the option you choose is. Great, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else uh, on the commission have any other questions for Nalisa around this particular quote for this uh, study? No? Uh, just one quick question, Alicia. Sure. What, uh, what kind of time scale are we talking about? Well, we can begin uh, right away. It shouldn't take more than 60 days, depending on the data um, in, in, from your billing company. Uh, there won't be any cost data or anything for your staff. It'll be completely out of your billing company. Uh, and so we should be able to, to roll that pretty quickly. Thank you. And once again, our approval here would be a recommendation to city council to approve this, um, this study, correct? Correct. Okay. Are we ready for a motion, John? I am. I move to accept the recommendation and move to city council that we um, commission this work. Second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of uh, approving the recommendation of the uh, rate study or the, the study of the uh, LUE uh, to City Council uh, for approval. And aye. I, I would also like to note um, that Commission Member William Teton has joined the meeting. All right, I was late, everybody. No problem. Welcome. Welcome to the beer club. <laughs> Happy to be here and in the club. <laughs> Excellent. Moving on uh, to the next agenda item number four, discussion of possible action on a quote from Melissa to perform the rate, uh, water rate study. Uh, so this is the second packet that was, uh, again, part of the meeting agenda and also circulated this afternoon uh, by Ashley. Uh, very similar uh, to uh, the LUE study, just with some additional <laughs> additional work included. So um, before we uh, turn it over to Nalisa for this as well, I just wanted to ask Amber, we did this, uh, I don't, not recently, but we have done this, was it with HDR before? And, there were, there, and what yeah. year was that? Was that three years ago? Three years ago. Okay. Okay, and again, consistent with, uh, I would say, general efforts to try to do a rate study every three to five years. Um, I would certainly like to learn that the rate study comes back saying that we did okay when we last looked at this, um, but certainly understand the need to continue to evaluate and analyze what we're doing. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Nalisa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, in looking at your water rate study, uh, we're basically going to do the same four steps or similar four steps that we did with wastewater. Uh, the first step is to establish and develop a revenue requirement, which are the revenues we need to recover from your rates every year. Uh, we'll use that same cash basis methodology. We'll start off with looking at your budget, but then we'll work with you all and your staff to understand do we need to adjust that budget and what it appropriate adjustments we may look at 
including, for example, looking at reserve policies. I know that was one thing we found on the wastewater. We added a little there. So we'll work with you to identify what may be appropriate on the water side. Um, we can also look at, like we did on wastewater, uh, various scenarios. So we can add a little, change a little, whatever we need to do on that side. The second step is to perform what's called functionalization, which I promise is not a made up word, or at least the American Water Works Association says it's not. Webster Dictionary disagrees. Uh, but <laughs> functionalization, to understand that, we first have to understand how we build our water utility. When we build a water utility, we build it with all sorts of extra capacity to handle times of peak demand. By design, this water utility is built for July when everybody in town is watering their lawns and taking a shower and uh, running their dishwashers and their washing machines all at the same time. By law, it has to be built with this excess capacity. Um, what functionalization does is assigns costs based on the functional nature of the cost. Um, going back to the way the water utility is built, I always give an analogy of a restaurant. If we go to a local restaurant uh, in the middle of the afternoon at two o'clock on a Tuesday, you probably find the place is a ghost town. Nobody's even there, maybe one or two tables, but probably not a whole lot of people. But if you go to that same restaurant at seven or eight o'clock on a Friday night, you have every table packed. Uh, you may even have to wait in line to get in, if it's a good restaurant anyway. So it would be easy to ask though, if you look at that restaurant, how many tables that restaurant serves over a 24 hour period, uh, it'd be easy to ask, well, you know, the, the restaurant maybe only serves three customers in 24 hour per hour. So why in the world does a restaurant have 50 tables? Their answer, is this extra capacity handle times of peak demand. Our water utility is built with this extra capacity. And as it turns out, there's a cost impact to maintaining that extra capacity. Uh, first of all, we had to build everything bigger. So any infrastructure costs, uh, that extra capacity we're building in for July and that won't be used in January, uh, we had to spend more on it. We likewise have um, to build, a, everything's bigger, so you have to have bigger motors, bigger pumps that cost more to operate um, and maintain. And the bigger everything is, it's just the, the more those things cost to operate. So what cost functionalization does is we go through on a line item by line item basis, and we assign costs to three categories. First category is the base cost of service, which is the cost of meeting extra or average daily demands. The second category is extra capacity cost of service, which is the cost of meeting the peaking demand on the system. Uh, that extra capacity we have so that we can meet that peak in July, but it sits idle in January. That's what extra capacity costs are. And the third category are customer costs. This is the cost of reading meters, um, sending bills to customers, et cetera. Once we've looked at those three cast cost categories, we then assign by customer class cost to those categories, or we allocate. So average costs or the base costs of service are allocated to customers looking at customers' historical average daily demands. The extra capacity cost of service though are allocated to customers looking at customers' uh, peaking demands on the system. And finally, customer costs, which are again that meter reading and customer service rep uh, element, uh, are assigned based off of pro rata share of customer count. Once we've allocated costs, then we get to the fourth step, which is to design rates. And we look at a couple factors. The first is we look at our customer class. Are, this, are they appropriate? Are they... Um, achieving from a policy perspective? Are they fair and equitable? We look at our base fees and identify the appropriate level of a base fee and, and from a policy perspective where you need to be from a cost or revenue generation perspective. Uh, and then we look at your volumetric rates. Not only do we look at the volumetric rates themselves, but we also look at whether we need to, what kind of tiered rate structure we need to look at as well. Um, it's in this step that we do lots of uh, coordinating with you all 
to make sure that that rate design, uh, while they're cost-based, uh, and as Christopher pointed out earlier, we have these kind of philosophy, these elements here. The first step is we're gonna determine what it costs and what it should be. And then we get into the policy and the implementation skills. Um, and we work with you on a policy perspective to achieve your policy goals and directions, uh, but also make sure we have the revenue coming in that you need and we make final recommendations based off of that. Um, from a deliverable perspective, uh, we'll come to you as we go through the process. Uh, it'll be somewhat similar to what we did on the wastewater rate study side where we give you some draft results we talk through, receive your feedback and your direction in terms of changes, tweaks, what kind of policy concerns you have, um, what we need to address. Um, and we continue to kind of work in a circular fashion going back and forth throughout the process till we get to final recommendations that you're comfortable with and that achieve your goals. Um, very similar to the wastewater rate study, we are not limiting the number of meetings or visits or scenarios uh, because we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we just achieve your goals and, and give you a product that you're happy with and that you can implement. Uh, so that said, I'm happy to answer questions. Before I, I open it up, and, and uh, we will in just a sec, I just have one more question for Amber, which is, Three years ago, we did the study. How long has it actually been from when we implemented the change in those rates as far as how much data do we have to look back on? Is it two full years of billing cycle under the new rates or is it less or is it more? I just, I wanna make sure we understand what we'll be reviewing from a existing uh, rate study. Sure, um, it looks like it um, not quite two full years. Um, we implemented the new rates in April, I think of 18, um, started at the, um, the end of uh, the third quarter in 2017, started the rate study and uh, finished it up. We always uh, give customers 60 days notice. So we probably really finished it up in January and then gave notice and then implemented in April. So we'll have April of 18 through April of, well, through whenever it would be if we started immediately, but you can think of even December of 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so then my, my question to Nalisa is, is that a sufficient amount of historical data from a timing perspective for this to be the right time to do a study? So there's two pieces of the historical data. From the historical data, we'll look at the revenue recovery and that's important. Uh, but really the more important piece is your billing data and you have plenty of historical data there because it's just the gallons used, the number of customers, et cetera. And that's the more important piece. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. everyone let me say that. So I'll open it up now um, for any other questions. Yeah, I have some questions. Uh, first of all, we have a trial uh, use of, um, of uh, electronic meters that will be reporting through cell phone. There's some investment going on. Are you going to consider that? Uh, we have about a dozen out there. I have one. It seems to work great. Do. But, <laughs> so uh, that's one, one, ask, one question about an investment uh, over the next couple of years in doing those replacements. The other question is the... Um, the uh, I, situation in Rollingwood is we buy in bulk and distribute our water. Most of our uh, infrastructure is in place and we are under a contract with the city of Austin, which has some limits on uh, maximum rate of use and also total volume limits that uh, I don't think we've come closer than 50% of our total volume limits, but I'm not sure about that. But certainly those limitations of our contract uh, ought to be considered. Maybe that's the most important thing to consider in encouraging conservation and uh, in the use of water because it is a, now a shared resource under our contract. I don't know if you're aware of that or you have the information on that contract to guide you in setting the rates and encouraging conservation. Great question. So, so the first question regarding the electronic meters um, we would definitely want to look at scenarios there for you if you're evaluating making those investments. Part of the scenarios we'd run 
is what does that look like to your rates and how do we pay for that? So we would look at that and we'd look at your fund balance. Do we have the cash? Do we need to add something to your rates to fund that? Are you leasing? Will you lease those meters? And we can look at each of those different scenarios to help you reach a decision on uh, that piece of it without a doubt. Related to the city of Austin contract, one of the, the pieces of information that we would have absolutely need is of course copies of the contract with the city of Austin as well as the historical data as far as your rated volume what the total is um, your peaking so we'd look at we go back and look at all of your city of Austin bills for the last couple of years um, and evaluate that we'd also talk to the city of Austin um, one to understand what their plans are because their costs, of course, uh, if they increase their rates, guess who gets that some of that increase to come through. So we'll definitely need to understand from the city of Austin what their plans in the coming years are for their rates. Uh, but also we'll look at how that contract impacts you from a cost basis. And so we'll definitely review the contract and build in the parameters around that contract into the analysis as well. Uh, Finally, as that contract applies, that's one of the big things on a policy side is to understand one, how those peakings and those rates of use impact you all from a cost perspective, and then working with you all on a policy perspective to make sure your rates appro appropriately reflect those priorities. If it's a concern for you on the conservation side of things, on the peaking side of things, that's part of how we can do that is, is through those rates and especially a tiered rate structure. Phil, you're on. There we go. Um, I got a question or at least a couple of questions. Um, we, uh, as a city of Rollingwood, uh, put together a strike force, which is also looking at how the town develops over the future years. And we're in very early stages of that. And we're gonna be working closely with all the community to get inputs and everything and what's going on. Now I know there's been some studies done in the past or you know, there's been some consultants already brought in to, to suggest things which may or may not work. And you know, clearly there's a lot of, uh, how can I say friction out there as to some of the directions in which that's going and some uh, and less than the others. So it's it's kind of a, a point towards that. This is kind of looking at the city of Rollingwood now, as we currently are. How easy is all of these studies to um, manufacture, to develop with some form of assumed growth of residential and residential and commercial going forward? We absolutely build that into the model for that reason. So what we do, the way we build the model is to give you a lot of flexibility there so we can run those what if scenarios, we can look at it. Also, it is not uncommon for clients to call me two or three years in, uh, down the road and say, what if we change this or you know this development is no longer going to be quarter acre lots they're going to be half acre lots what does that do and we're able to go in and look at those scenarios even in the future you know we put together a five-year plan for you um, we can go longer than five years if you so desire um, usually five years is kind of beyond that that crystal ball gets pretty fuzzy but to that extent, if you want to go further out, we can certainly, you know, pull the analysis out further to look at those types of things um, and then allow you to look at various scenarios. So, for example, if uh, the questions start getting asked, well, what, you know, what, what happens if we change you know, our number of connections goes from X to Y versus A to C? Um, what happens there, we can certainly put in those different options and scenarios for you. Um, and I build it all that way just for that purpose. Okay, and the other thing is, um, I know within the uh, committee, we've got various subcommittees, and I think Tom Farrell, who's the chair of the strike force, is also looking at the uh, impacts of wastewater on any future kind of development. So I'm sure Clark is uh, familiar with a lot of the work that uh, Tom did in, on that with the contract. And it, one of the nuances around the contract, which I learned last night, was uh, there are also drought restrictions with respect, if you're in a drought, things change significantly with regards to the contract. Um, 
is the, the, I assume that will need to also be included in any of the work and that you're proposing to do on this subject. Yes, yes. So one of the things your as far as drought goes is we, you know, I'm sure many of you recall several years ago when Lake Travis was dwindling down and we were in a severe drought, we actually had to go to some pretty strict restrictions. And of course that had a huge um, revenue impact to utilities. And so one of the things you'll have within your rates uh, you'll look at is your standard rate that you're charging in normal times, but then um, what happens in the event of a drought? If you have to do a 20% curtailment, um, well, that's, you know, what does that do? Because that comes off of your highest tiered structure usually. And so what does that do to your revenues um, and how do you recover that? And that's definitely a policy concern and issue that you've got to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions regarding the proposed rate, uh, water rate study? No? Would anyone like to make a motion to recommend this to City Council? Or do we would we like more time to consider and discuss further? I'll move to uh, make the recommendation to approve the uh, Send this to the city council for their approval. Second. So we have a motion and second uh, to recommend to city council uh, the water rate study. Um, and we'll say uh, all in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Melissa, we appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. You all have a great evening. And if you have any other questions, just let Amber or Ashley know and they'll find me. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Moving on to the regular agenda item number five presentation, discussion, and possible action on a scope of services for easement location and identification from WSB Engineering. Amber, is there anything you'd like to let us know in advance of turning this over? Sure. Um, I think uh, Mayor Dyson had kind of asked the Utility Commission to take up the charge of identifying the easements that uh, the city has um, and then verifying that uh, we actually have them uh, and they're recorded properly and and things like that in preparation for any uh, water line improvements um, and especially any drainage, regional drainage improvements we might undertake. And so um, uh, Jay uh, had, they they came in close second to our current, our new city engineers, Kay Fries. Um, he's with WSB and he had mentioned um, during his proposal that that was one of the things they, they could help us out with. And so we asked him to go ahead and give us a proposal and um, see if we could get started on that project. Thank you, Amber. Uh, thank you, uh, Jay, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I will turn over to you. Thank you, Chair Miller and members of the commission. Appreciate the opportunity. And Amber did a nice job of kicking off what <clears throat> really is a pretty big undertaking. I mean, when you really think about it, um, figuring out where all the easements are in a community that's been platted over many years is not the easiest thing to do. Um, and really to, to start, and this is what I shared with the staff, if you went and did title work on every single property in the city, which is really the only way to be 100% certain, and let's say you've, you've got five or 600 properties, that could quickly be $250,000, $300,000 just in title work. That's not drawing them on a map that's not doing anything that's just getting title work that's not where we're that's not where we're trying to get that's not the goal and so i talked about a couple of projects where we've done this had this kind of an undertaking for other communities um, we've really tied it into the gis systems for those communities and so if if uh the commission would indulge uh chair miller if i could share my screen and I just want Question, to show GIS. Platform. What's that? Go ahead. GIS. Yes. 
Not familiar. Oh, uh, geographic information systems. It's a mapping tool that is powered by data. And so actually, if I pull up the map, I can show you what it that's looks fine. like. I just, one of my new year's resolutions was if I didn't understand a three letter, letter acronym, I'm going to ask. <laughs> and that's, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So if, if it's okay, if I share my screen, sure. okay, thank you. Please. Uh, let me make sure I get the right thing here. There it is. So, um, one of the, one of the things that we do as a company is serve approximately 40 different cities as city engineers. So we've learned a lot about what cities want and need out of a mapping system. And so hopefully you can see this. This is an example of a, this is a totally web-driven, web-based, it is not a proprietary software of a community where I was the city engineer for 14 years until I came down to Texas four years ago. And so to get, as we talk about what GIS is, in this map, this is just a map of the city with, if I zero in, you can actually see the parcels. We get that data from the county. So in this case, Travis County can provide that type of data for use in developing a base map. And then over time, we, we created the water distribution system, for instance, and you were just talking about water. And when I, and when I say there's data behind it, this is what I mean. When you pick a section of pipe, it talks about its six inch diameter pipe. Um, it get, it's got a length. And then with some of these, some of them are older, so we don't have as much information. So I gotta find one that's maybe a little newer. This community is a lot of the water system was built in the 1930s. And so you can imagine the records we had to work with. So here I selected a section of pipe it says what size it is. And then we actually also have a link and we can pull up the as-built drawing from when that water main was put in. And so that's on a site. And so you then have that at your fingertips and we can do the same thing with easements. We can do it for sewer, storm sewer and, and the like. And some of the data was mapped initially using CAD drawings. Some of it was collected in the field. Uh, a lot of that data was collected by the city staff themselves using very basic equipment uh, to, to collect that data. So in this community- Can I ask you to hit easements? Yep. So that's what I was gonna do. So this shows the easements that we have mapped. Now in this community, we did not dig into easements like you are wanting to do. We have another community where we did. Unfortunately, they host their own data at their city hall. And so I, I couldn't share that with you. This is something that I could share. But you can imagine you'd have a drawing with easement lines and you'd be able to select that easement and it would, it would be categorized. It would say whether it's a drainage easement, um, if it's a water line easement, um, whatever the type of easement it is. And you can then, if you've got the documents, you can scan those and link that to the easement as well. So now you've got that easement document right at your fingertips or a plat. If it was on a plat, you could scan those. There's, we do have some communities where we've created and it, we don't have it. Oh, here, here's plats. So like on this, in this community, we we outlined where the plats were. And then within that boundary, I gotta see if I can pick these or not. Yeah, this gives you the name of the plat that it's in um, and some other information. If we had the actual plat scanned, we could attach it to it as well. So uh, in talking with the staff, they felt it would be important to kind of show this in terms of kind of a end product uh, because once you start with the easements and you have this base map pulled together, you can start to build on that. One of the things that we talked about 
um, with that I talked about with the staff was a need to get to have the water and the sewer and the stormwater mapped in a similar fashion to what we're showing here. We also have signs. There's a bunch of other stuff, the zoning. I mean, that you can go, you can add as much as you want, but getting that base map created and having the easement, sorry, when I zoom out, they I lose the detail. Anyway, um, by having the easements in there, you now are building a GIS in your community. Okay, and so um, other things that this that this can do are things like uh, even if you just pick a property, it gives who the owner is, and you can find out all sorts of information. You can create mailing lists by selecting properties. It's very convenient. It's something that cities do often. And so when you're trying to create a mailing list, you can go in and select 30 properties in a minute and create a mailing list pretty much immediately. So it's having this data warehoused in this fashion um, can is really a powerful tool that the staff and residents can use. And you can even pull this up on a phone. And I had David try it to make sure that that he could see it, but you can pull this up on a mobile device. You can pull it up anywhere. So um, this would be the, the base, the basis for um, physically drawing the easements on a map. That's where, that, that's what we've, that's what we're talking about now, but I just wanted to show that you could build on it. Well, and Hey, I just want to add to that, um, you know, David and I were really excited about finally getting our system on an interactive map that uh, he can pull up in the field and access. Um, we can be more accurate with, you know, when we do have to uh, fix a water line break, we know where our valves are, we know um, what kind of material we're going to need uh, to repair a water leak. And if a, you know, one of the staff people walk out, um, that institutional knowledge doesn't just all leave with them. Um, so we were really excited when we saw this, um, this uh, technology and an opportunity to get our system into an um, interactive map. So yes. I know that mapping the water system was something that had been discussed and has been discussed. Um, so th this map can do multiple things. Are we considering in this proposal, all of those different items on this map or just one particular item today, which is on the easement side uh, or and each one of those additional, uh, if you wanna add the water system, if you wanna do other things will, will be, um, reviewed at a different time. I just want to make sure, are we looking at the comprehensive map that I, I think is consistent with what I, I know Amber and David probably want now um, or, or wanted yesterday? Uh, is this just consistent with what, what we're looking for and what city council is looking for? Are you asking me? <laughs> I'm asking Amber, I'm a, I, even if, if, if uh, the Councilwoman Patillo would love to, if she knows what they're looking for. I mean, it seems great. I, I, I understand one, I agree, a map that is um, accessible in the field, very important for work being done, and a map that can be continually updated um, and isn't lost after somewhat, right? This, this stays with the city, very important. So it seems like there's a lot of value here. I just wanna make sure it's consistent with what the, what the ask and expectations of, of the council and, and of, of, you know, of Amber and David are. Sure, so tonight you are just, um, you are just going to consider the easement portion of this, but we plan to build um, on, on this map. And I do believe it would be consistent with what, um, you know, council has directed us to do as far as making sure we know what we have um, in the ground and that we're able to efficiently uh, repair and maintain the systems. Um, Amy, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, 
Um, hi, sorry, I'm driving, so I had to get to a stoplight so I could <laughs> communicate. Um, yeah, that this all seems consistent with the with what the mayor proposed that the council start or affirm basically that we wanted to do as far as having a map that evaluates easements and that that would then provide us with more information that we could use in developing water and wastewater plans in the future. Great, thank you uh, for that as well. Uh, any other questions from uh, the commission? Yeah, I have a question. Um, in the, uh, what is the underlying software that we're working with? Uh, you know, I'm in the geological sciences, but we use ARC Info uh, is our standard. And what, what are we working with? And is it gonna be compatible, for example, in uh, combining with Austin and Westlake Hills at some point? Right, uh, great question. And I do have a little bit of more information in terms of the, the actual easement project itself that I'll get to in a minute. But on the software, um, this is driven, uh, the data warehousing is through a partnership with ArcGIS Online and it's an Esri product. We, we work with Esri okay. all the time. The interface you're seeing is an interface we developed ourselves because over time, Arc, Arc GIS online is not something you can really customize. And what we found was the communities we were working with wanted other stuff, not just what you could get out of the box. So we created the interface you see where you can make mailing labels, you can create custom, uh, customized types of routines within your own city if you believe you need it. And so we found that there's three or four things that cities really want. And so we just went and created it because it just made sense. Okay. So in terms of the easements themselves, I just have a couple of notes here to show. Um, so the deliverable at the end, and this image that you see is from the community that I referred to that they're hosting their own data. And so I can't show you, you know, I can't interact with it, but you can see here that this has got easements drawn. They're different colors, depending on the type of easement they are. Um, you can select those easements. And, and if there's information attached, you will have access to that information. It's web-based, as I mentioned, the easements actually would have to be physically drawn. So that's really kind of the biggest time consuming item after finding all the records, right? Is you got to go in and draw them. It's just not a, you know, there, there, there's no real way around that. Uh, you can classify them, you can attach relevant documents. And again, it's cloud hosted. And so you don't have to worry your server crashed over at city hall or you're updating that's being hosted in a cloud environment. In talking with the staff, we've we've landed on a, a recommended phased approach, so that you're not going all in at once, um, because you have a lot of data available in at at the city hall, and you can pull a lot of the plats together and some of the documents that you have. Use that available data. Use those accessible documents and start there, as opposed to getting into deep dives on title searches and things like that. Um, once we get the available data mapped, then we can come back and say, okay, here's how much we've been able to get just from records that you have here at, at City Hall without diving any deeper and then make a decision. Do we dive deeper maybe in a specific area uh, of town, something of that nature? If, if we get to a point where we really do need to do a deeper dive, Travis County has records we can go over to the county. Uh, title research, as I mentioned, there could be a need for a field survey. Um, and one of the things we also talked about was correlating it to correlating the deeper dive or making sure we got things right to those priority project areas where maybe you've got some drainage issues. And I know in the infrastructure report, 
I've looked at that. There's certain hot spots, right? So you might just focus on those areas as opposed to every parcel in the city. So you could do that. So the cost range to do this, and I assume that there would be 250 or 300 easements that we need to draw, is a 15 to 22,500 range. As I said, most of it is the time to draw. It, if it takes a half hour to an hour per easement, you can see how that adds up. Uh, there is some software licensing, that's an annual fee, that is with ArcGIS online, and that's a 500 to $750 annual fee just to have that software, but that gets you the cloud hosting and uh, gets you the, the base map that you need to start. Um, just by way of comparison to, to convert, let's say a water map that you have in CAD and bring it into a system like this, it's probably a one day undertaking. So far less of an undertaking than trying to physically draw easements on a map. So just trying to give you some scale so you don't start thinking, man, is it gonna be like $20,000 every time we wanna bring a water main map or a sewer main map in? If you've got it drawn, it can come in very quickly. So that, that's where we've landed. Um, in, in working with the staff, we believe that this is a good approach uh, so that if you do want to know where the easements are, this is a good way to start. It, it might not be everything, but you're going to be a lot further along than you are now. So with that, I, if there's other questions or comments, I'm, I'd be happy to answer those. Not to cast dispersions. I really, this don't take this the wrong way. <clears throat> In prior lives, I've dealt with situations where we bought things for companies or my school and you know the software provider either disappears or triples their price or whatever and what would happen if would we own this would this be ours the data would all be yours yes but the would the the could could the people in the field still use it if for whatever reason, we don't come to terms three years from now? Well, um, anything's possible. Um, Esri, who's the parent company that's been, they're really the key player in GIS I mean, worldwide. Uh, they've been around as long as I've been in the workforce. Um, I don't see where they're, I mean, it, basically what would have to happen is Esri would have to fold because it's their software. And so it's not paying us for some license and then we go away. That's a different deal. This is ArcGIS Online, very common, very commonly used in communities. The only thing we developed is the interface. And that's a, that, that is something that can just get put on top of the system uh, to create that user interface. And there are some costs associated with that but the data is always yours. That data doesn't go away. Thank you. Clark, this question is for you since you had a question around the, the underlying data uh, and, and the right. I mean, Esri sounds like this is kind of they're the standard right now for this type of information. Um, and this is not something that it's one thing when a company or a service provider within the software industry no longer can provide the service. It's another thing when the data standard changes to something else and then it's, it's nothing, you know, there's no longer compatibility. Is there any concern that were your concerns addressed by the answer regarding, you know, th this service provider, the type of data that is being used? Yes. I think the Esri and the ARC system has got, I think decades of investment and use and it's widely used in, as I mentioned in the geological sciences, but other all, all over the place. So I think uh, it's pretty firm uh, as, as a solid uh, company and future I'm not worried about. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? No? 
based on uh, the feedback from Clark, also based on the feedback from uh, Councilwoman Patillo around this being uh, aligned with what we believe City Council is looking for around mapping uh, not only easements, uh, but other things such as eventually the water system and, and potentially there's, there's uh, other options as well as we build off this, um, I would go ahead and make a recommendation um, a motion that we uh, approve sending this to city council for consideration. So uh, is that needing a second then? I'll certainly second it. Yeah. Great, my motion was seconded. Um, so all in favor of sending the recommendation for uh, the mapping of the easements uh, project to City Council for recommendation and approval? Aye. Aye. Anything Clark says, I'm with. The guy knows more about underground than anybody. <laughs> All right, and I as well. Phil, did you say I? Okay, gotcha. So that motion passes. Thank you very much, Jay. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you Jay. for the opportunity. Moving on to regular agenda item number six, which is an update on the electronic water meter test program. Who is providing the update on the water meter test program? I can, uh, Jonathan, and then David, if you want to fill in. Um, I think there's an update in your packet. Um, all 15 meters have been installed. Um, we're, we're even ahead of the update in the packet. Um, all 15 have been installed. I think you all should have gotten letters that talks to how you can uh, interact with your um, water meter. Um, so we're just excited that it's finally up and going and anxious to see how everybody likes it. Yes, I got mine today. So I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> so I was uh, testing it when we went out of town for a couple of days and I was expecting to see zero and the first day it was 0.9 gallons. And I said, what can that be? Well, it turns out it's probably my ice maker in my refrigerator. <laughs> wow. And the next day was zero. So it really did no. a good job. Oh, that's very cool. So that's, uh, all right. Thank you very much. I think would anyone else have any other questions about the electronic water meter? All right, moving on to item number seven, which is an update on the fire hydrant testing and painting project. David, um, this report. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Apple hydrant has been out and coming out for several months now and they slowed down because of the pandemic. But, um, and we also have some problems because we're having low water pressures at the hydrants and the average pressure of the normal required flow rate is 100, 1,000 gallons per minute at 20 PSI. And some of them have been like 893 and things like that. So we've been working with AWR to go around the city and open some valves that potentially might have been shut or partially closed. And those pressures have come back up so that um, we have less areas that we had where the, where the flow wasn't 1,000 PSI, 1,000 gallons per minute. But they're coming back out in the uh, second week of December to go back over and uh, look at the areas where the pressures are low and see if they've come back up. Um, they'll also be painting the hydrants at that time. And um, we also have one, another fire hydrant that's at uh, four, uh, 406 Riley. That is, um, is that right there, Amber? That's, um, yes, actually, that's yeah, it's a frozen, it's a frozen hydrant. It actually means that you can't actually open it up at the top. So they're gonna, re they've given us an estimate to uh, replace that one, which I have the price is $8,625, which I'll have to double double check with last time we had one replaced, we'll, we use Crossroads to see if that's kind of in price or not. Wow, okay. And the other thing is that we've had a um, um, phased out plans for a, uh, abandoned water lines and stuff that's been going on some of the phases and uh, double checking to make sure that all that stuff has actually been done and some of it 
I, I really don't. Some of the some of the water lines that we say are abandoned aren't actually abandoned. They'll, they'll abandon them right to a valve. And a valve isn't good enough because a valve won't hold it. You don't even know if it's holding. So that's something that we're going to be looking at. Is is this is kind of different than the fire hydrants, but it's, what we're looking at doing is is splitting the city up in four different zones. And within them zones, we're gonna we're gonna get the city engineer and AWR and a third water third party contractor that uh, uh, he's been around for like 20, 30, 40 years doing it and determine where we need to put point valves and forget about those other valves right now, put point valves in so that we can isolate the city when we have leaks. Cause right now some of these valves that you can't shut them because they're 50 years old and they're calciumed up and, and um, that's the best way to do it as a moment. It's just, get something that works, find out where we want to put them. And then in the other valves, that ones when we decide that we're abandoned lines, we're just going to fill them up with concrete so that nobody can go back there later on down the road and, and turn them up and and uh, interfere with what we have going at the moment. Great. Thank you for the update there. Does anyone else have anything else to share as we're finished with the regular agenda? No. Well, with that, I will move to adjourn the meeting and Second. say thank you and good night to everyone. Appreciate everyone's participation this evening. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.